Nice to have you back to our last session as we talk about getting along with people, of course, from the heart of the Apostle Peter, who knew well what interpersonal conflict was. But I want to remind you again of these principles so that when we can now get to another part of the motivation that he talked about. Principle number one was to look for common ground. Principle number two, enter into the world of their feelings. Principle number three, treat all people as important. Principle four, be gutsy enough to forgive. Number five, look, stop looking out for number one. Six, don't bite back. Seven, retaliate with a blessing. Eight, muzzle your mouth. Nine, swerve to avoid a collision. Ten, do the right thing. And eleven, be a peace chaser. Well, earlier in verse nine and ten, we talked about the first two motivations. You remember that? That the reason why our motivation for getting along with people Number one is that it's the natural response to God's supernatural blessing in our lives. We've been blessed to be a blessing. Number two, as you remember in verse 10, was that getting along with others is our ticket to a long and happy life. And <coughs> excuse me, who doesn't want that? But now I want us to look together, you have your Bibles open, to verse 12. Because after laying out all of these principles and a couple of the motivations... He wants to wrap up our time with some more motivation. So he's kind of mixing up, if you will, these principles with the motivations. And in verse 12, he says something so curious when it comes to getting along with people. He says, For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So here's Peter anthropomorphizing God. In other words, he's giving human attributes to the invisible God. Uh, eyes and ears and, and a face. When we know that God is spirit, right? No one has seen God at any time. But we also know our theology of the Son of God, don't we? Our Christology that tells us that, you know, that you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1, 1, and the Word, what, became flesh and dwelt, tabernacled among us, verse 14 of John 1. That Colossians 1, 15 says what? That He's the visible image of the invisible God, chapter 2, verse 9 of Colossians, that in Him, Christ, all in the fullness of deity dwelt in bodily form. So if we want to see God, remember John 14, you have to look at Christ. So in essence, what Peter is saying and you know the story of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where Jesus appears to Simon Peter even before he appears to the other apostles. He appeared to Cephas. Peter didn't tell him that. He was so afraid of his fellow apostles that he didn't say anything. And the women kept saying, you know, meet him in Galilee. And they wouldn't move out of the room. And even the two uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus finally say, and he appeared to not only James, but to Cephas, to Peter. Peter goes, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you guys. Not very brave. But he had seen Christ. He lived with him and had seen the risen Lord. Don't, don't miss this. And here he is now telling us how to get along with people. And he's saying, you know what? I want you to imagine Christ. That's not a bad thing. You try to imagine the Father, that is. Try to have a visual image of the Father, you're going to fall into something. But I want you to picture Christ with his loving eyes watching you, his attentive ears listening to you, and his face either turning toward you or away from you. And then he goes on. Motivation number three, look at it in your outlines. God's loving eyes are watching us. That's a motivation to get along with people. Verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. Now, I wish I could tell you that I'm always a safe driver. But like most of us, I have what we call black and white fever. You know, I am so obedient when there's a policeman around. You know, I see a speed limit. I, I'm okay. I'm not a real speed demon because I don't like speed, but I... I've certainly violated speed limits, and I'm sure you have. But the moment a police car comes on, boy, you're suddenly the best driver on the road. And you're hoping he passes you so you can get back to driving like you want to drive. Anybody? Now, you're going to admit this. Anybody? I've driven with you. I know that's true. 
there are check police all around with your name and their little card going looking for you, you know. <laughs> So the point is, is that he's saying, you want to get along with people, then Im imagine Christ paying attention to you, watching you, because he is everywhere, isn't he? He said, lo, I'm with you always. We love to talk about that, except in the middle of a fight. <laughs> How about quoting that in the middle of an argument? Lo, I'm with you always, even under the end of the age, you know? So he sees, he sees he sees. He sees our need for deliverance uh, for, from trouble. He, he sees our need for self-restraint. Uh, Bette Midler uh, sang a song that, you know, God is watching us from a distance. No, no, no. He's watching us right from your living room. In fact, he's watching us from the inside out. So one of the motivations for getting along is that. So the next time we're tempted to mistreat somebody in an argument, in a conflict, then look in the rearview mirror of your life and see Jesus. That, that's what Peter's saying. That's a pretty good principle. To remind yourself in the middle of a conflict, you know what, Jesus is right here. So maybe you go up to somebody who's got a problem and say, you know, I'd like to talk to you. And in the presence of Jesus, let's have a conversation. Wow. You remind. In the presence of Jesus... Let's discuss, honey, our difference. Say that to your teenager. In the presence of Jesus, I want to talk to you. And I pray that I speak with his words and listen with his heart. Did you hear that? I pray that I speak with his words and listen with his heart. Try that in an argument sometime. I cannot tell you how many times in 40 years of ministry those exact words have softened a conflict in my office at the church. I want to listen with his heart and pray that I speak with his words. Try that. Motivation number four, God's attentive ears are listening to us. Look again in verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer don't miss this. Circle the word there. Is it in your Russian translation? I know it's in the Czech translation, Polish translation. Not our prayer, theirs. In other words, in the middle of a conflict, God is listening to the other person too. Wow. Because even James says, remember that he's the Lord of Sabaoth, and he does what? He listens to the outcry of those who are being misused, mistreated. Wow. Oh. You understand when you mistreat somebody and they're there in their heart crying out to God, he's listening to them about you. Ouch. That's what, you, that's what Peter says. You know, I love the story of the little guy. He's praying next to his bed and he begins shouting, God, give me a new bike. And his brother says, well, why are you shouting to God? He hears your whispers. And he says, I know that, but grandma can't hear. <laughs> God isn't hard of hearing, is he? He hears us when we cry for help. When's the last time in the middle of a conflict that you just said, we need to pray? I need to pray right now. Can we just be quiet? I just need to soften my heart because I'm getting angry. Wow. And a person sitting there ready to, no, this, this, let me, can I just have a moment just to just be quiet? One of the rules of fighting that we have in my marriage is that we never leave a room. You never leave the house, but you never leave a room. You can stop talking so that you can quiet, so you don't overreact, but you can never leave a room. You never slam a door. You never prevent access. Because we always want to, when a person's ready, I'm ready to talk now. Well, I'm not yet. Okay, when you get ready, let me know. But we are not going to bed until we finish this. Sure speeds up the process. I'll say to people, we are not going to leave this office until we can get at least some part of this resolved. As best you can. So the idea now, Psalm 102, uh, uh, which is, by the way, the title of it is a, a prayer for the afflicted when he is faint and pours out his complaint before the Lord. Have you ever had that? It is pouring out your heart. 
And I love it. It says, hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry for help come to you, to thee. Don't think for a minute that we get away with hurting other people because God hears their cries. He hears them. But then the third motivation, and this one kind of shocks us. God's angry face is set against those of us who do evil. Listen to Peter's last words. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and His ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The evil there is those who mistreat others in conflict. That's the context. See, we love to quote number 6, you know, verse 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine on you and be gracious to you. Let the Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you His shalom, His peace. We love that, don't we? Oh, God, thank you. Let your face shine upon me. But let me tell you something. In the middle of a conflict, when you're mistreating somebody, he turns his face away from you. Ouch. Oh, we love to say, you know, Jesus loves you. He does love you. That he welcomes you. He does welcome you. That he accepts you even as a stinky sinner. Yes, he does. He forgives you and cleanses you of all unrighteousness. Of course he does. But don't think for a minute that he's always happy with you. We don't like that, do we? Because we live in a world where everybody needs to feel like they're affirmed. Well, he's not going to affirm you when you mistreat others. Sorry. And don't get mad at me. Take it up with the author. And Peter is saying here, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, against those who sin against another and mistreat them. Wow. We're not only talking about the eyes of the Lord and the ears of the Lord, but the face of the Lord. And you don't get to ignore it when God the Son says, I, 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 can't, I can't look at what you're doing right now. It is so not like what you're supposed to be as my disciple. Have you ever done that with your kids? You know, I just, I love you. I'll die for you. I can't watch you. You ever done that with your kids? I don't like the way you're treating your brother. I don't like the way you're treating your sister. It hurts my heart. I don't want to see that ever again. Have you ever said that? That's what the Son of God says. I don't want to see that ever again. I will. I'll forgive you. I'll love you. I'll never depart from you. I'll never leave you. That's what you. But I don't have to like it. So I think we've got to pray in the midst of conflict, honest prayer. Lord, and this is not a fun prayer. In the middle of your argument, your conflict, you're defending yourself, you're mistreating. Lord, have you turned your face against me right now? That's what Peter said. One wonders what Peter felt when Jesus looked at him when he denied him. I've often thought about doing a sermon on the looks of Jesus. What did he look from the cross? What did he see when he looked at Peter? Did he just go? Because he had said before, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Oh, I have prayed for you, Luke 22, that your faith would not eclipse, would not fail. Ah, oh, but Peter, after you've repented, strengthen your brothers. After you've returned. Epistrepho. It's found in the back of a Coke bottle in the land of Greece today. After you've returned fulfilling. Isn't that good? Strengthen your brothers. But don't you think he looked at Peter and said, That's what I don't want to see happen to me in the midst of conflict. The prayer needs to be, Lord, help me to do what is right in such a way that you make your face shine upon me 
and you give me your shalom, your peace. Well, folks, there, there you have it. Huh? There you have it, these timeless truths for getting along with people and substantial motivations. President Theodore Roosevelt was on spot, spot on ready when he said this, the most significant ingredient in the formula for success is knowing how to get along with people. It can be summarized, in my opinion, this entire seminar, all the many minutes and hours that we spent together, ready, can be summarized in a phrase that we often use, and that's surrendering, dying to self. In fact, if I could have, I would have started this workshop with, all right, you want to get along with people? Die to self. That's it. We're done. Go home. Go back to your countries. Go. I'll take my 26-hour trip back to Fresno. Because that's what it is. But I'm so grateful that Peter chose to elaborate, aren't you? With these very practical principles and these motivations. But one of the ways that I get my head and heart matching, you know, that intellectual desire to walk like Jesus that has to match the heart desire, because sometimes it doesn't. Because in the middle of conflict, sometimes it's more about winning than it is being like Jesus, huh? So I read often this, and I want to read it to you. It's called Dying to Self. The problem is I don't know the author. I love sometimes not knowing an author, so I don't give credit to anybody but God. But I want to read this as we close our time. I want you to listen. I want you to listen not as an attender of a workshop or listening online, but as somebody that is in the middle of conflict or certainly will be a short time after we're done because that's human nature. Listen to these words. When you are forgiven or neglected, or purposely set it not, and you sting and you hurt with the insult or the oversight, but your heart is still happy, being counted worthy to suffer for Christ, that is dying to self. When your good is evil speaking of, when your wishes are crossed, your advice is disregarded, your opinions are ridiculed, and you refuse to let anger rise in your heart, or even refuse to defend yourself, but you take it all in patient, loving silence. That is dying to self. When you lovingly and patiently bear any disorder, any irregularity, any annoyance, when you can stand face to face with waste and folly and extravagance and spiritual insensitivity, insensibility rather, and you can endure it as Jesus endured it, that is dying to self. And when you are content with any food and any offering and any raiment and any climate and any house and any society and any solitude and any interruption by the will of God, that is dying to self. And when you never care to refer to yourself in a conversation or to record your own good works or to itch after commendation and when you can truly love to be unknown, that is dying to self. And when you see your brother prosper and have his needs met, and can honestly rejoice with him in spirit and feel no envy, nor question God while your own needs are far greater and in more desperate circumstances, that is dying to self. And when you can receive correction, listen, and reproof from one of less stature than yourself and humbly submit inwardly as well as outwardly, finding no rebellion and no resentment rising in your heart, that is dying to self. Let me say it more simply. Jesus said it this way. Take it with you. In Luke 9, verse 23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and follow me.